I just typed in the chat a uh, place where you can find information about the other upcoming events that are related to Visionary New England and Transcendental Modernism, which are the two shows that have opened at De Cordova last week. Um, there will be other events probably added. These only go through December. And in fact, uh, the shows that, that are up right now will run through mid-March. So just stay tuned if you're interested in these subjects, because I think in one way, the exhibitions took, took as much effort um, and time and intense intensity that they did just to reopen our museum. And so we have a little bit of a lag time in terms of um, what we are gonna program out from here. So, um, and also figuring out what the opportunities are with virtual versus in-person, which basically in-person is not possible. So I think I'm gonna get us started. And I know we have a, a number of other um, registrants and hopefully they'll just start to, to filter way, their way in, but I know it's a, um, lunchtime talk, and I want to keep things relatively short with time for discussion. Um, and, and so you can uh, get back to the things you were doing throughout the day. I'm Sarah Montrose, curator, senior curator at um, De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum. And this is the first event we have organized to um, be connected with our exhibitions, Visionary New England and Transcendental Modernism, that both of which opened um, about a week and a half ago at De Cordoba. Um, these were shows that were actually meant to open last April and due to the pandemic, as we shut down our indoor spaces, the delay brought us to October. Um, and so it's just an enormous thrill to actually work with art again, to be in the galleries and now to actually have a chance to talk publicly about the scope of the exhibitions that have been planned for a very long time. Um, as I mentioned, so this, this talk is going to be rather image and research heavy. I'll talk through some of the ways in which I've been thinking about this, the, the scope of this exhibition. I'll speak for about half an hour and I have a lot of things to share and I realize um, in the planning of the PowerPoint I presented that um, we probably won't get to everything. And so if there's interest or, you know, I just want to continue, I might create a part two to this discussion because there are so many amazing artists and projects that for those who maybe um, don't want to come into the physical spaces of the galleries, but would like to learn more about these projects, I'd like to make sure that there's a space for that. Um, so, Without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and jump right into um, to this presentation. So, like I said, I'll speak for about half an hour, um, and then there'll be a time for kind of question and answer. And if you want to, as as I'm speaking, you can ask questions in the chat function or comments, and I'd love to see those. Elizabeth, who's our incredible um, curatorial assistant and who navigated this exhibition with with me, full partner with me, um, here we go, um, will be helping to moderate that portion. So, and I also, I'm, I'm gonna say, this is an exhibition that to me is um, something really personal. In fact, I've described it as a love letter to New England. I um, returned to Massachusetts, to my home state, um, about five years ago. And since that time and working at De Cordova, which has a strong focus and commitment to the, to the artists of our region of New England, um, I've been kind of, kind of like coming to terms with what New England's character, history, um, dynamism, eccentric, eccentric qualities, like for me had meaning as sort of coming to terms with this relationship to, the where, to where I'm from. And I came across um, a number of historic episodes and cultural moments and contemporary artists um, over the past couple of years that cum cum like cum accumulated and accumulated and culminated in this exhibition that's called Visionary New England. Um, and it's an exhibition that spans past and present. So it features the work of about 12 contemporary artists um, but it also features many other earlier creators, thinkers, philosophers, and artworks embedded within the exhibition and in the catalog and in the research. And so this idea of a show being a very localized, so specific to a region, expansive in its scope and, and broad in its temporality it are things that I found quite interesting and challenging to conceive of through, the, through an exhibition process. Um, and so you just see here as a first slide, a pairing of sort of two artworks that 
obviously bear some visual affinities, but also speak to the connections past and present within this exhibition um, that are inspired by visionary, mystical, and utopian practices that are crucial to New England's history and character. And so I started this exhibition in the 1840s, looking at, inspired by a, the growth the uh, of agrarian communes, such as Brook Farm in Roxbury and Fruitlands in Harvard, um, connecting it to, and became interested in further along in time and, and contiguous to an intersections of spiritualism and experimental psychology from the late 19th through the early and mid 20th centuries. Um, these are just Two, two kind of um, strains of many others, but all, all, of, all of which um, accumulate into a way in which I've been interested in how New England has fostered alternative ways of nurturing community, personal enlightenment, and social reform. And often these figures, these people, these scholars of the region um, do so, pursue these aspects of life through an intimate connection, connection with nature. And through that connection, direct and divine connection with nature, they uh, are um, seeking seeking both a personal enlightenment and something that um, shapes a better society. So this idea, these ideas, kind of rumbled around in my head as I was working towards this show. Um, the exhibition over over time developed into a. Uh, an exhibition about many places and histories. So what you're seeing here is just an imperfect and uh, partial map of sites and communities connected to the vis to visionary New England's history. Um, some of these are places of where people have gathered um, that are connected to spiritualist faith or visionary practices. Um, some of these are the utopian communes that I mentioned. Some of these places no longer practice, but their site is still something you can visit. Um, so if you're interested in taking a kind of visionary New England road trip, I encourage you to come into the museum, look at the, the map that's on view in the galleries. You can see it here at right and plot out some amazing places to visit. Um, but the, 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 in the light blue, this exhibition also points out that um, these, these different places, many of them are active. And so this idea that history or historical content is somehow frozen in time and, and locked away, no longer accessible, is not, is not something I wanted to foreground. I actually wanted to show greater continuity of past and present and that the things that I'm interested in, in within the context of this show actually sit within the landscape and reveal themselves either through oral traditions or histories or things that get passed down through generations that stay with us. Um, one of the goals of this show, in which you can see these three stars at the center of this map, um, also indicate an effort on the part of myself and fellow collaborators to actually strengthen, strengthen um, the arts uh, and cultural connections of greater Boston. So I had two amazing collaborators at the Fitchburg Art Museum, Lisa Crossman, and at the Fruitlands Museum, Shana dumont -Gar, who have been with me along the way to organize related exhibitions um, that one of which has, oh, the dates of these are, are not correct. Sorry about that. Um, but both of these exhibitions um, relate to the topics of visionary New England in their own way and both in past and present histories. Um, the Fruitlands Museum show, if you go to their website, you'll, you'll be able to learn and visit. It's open now, whereas the Fitchburg Art Museum show has since closed, but hopefully some of you have, have seen it. And there's an amazing um, trove of, vis of uh, video programs you can still access if you're interested in that exhibition as well. And I wanted to point out, this is an exhibition that I'm realizing has um, a lot of in sort of continuity and connection with things that have been it's sort of bubbling in the art world, coming to the surface now, some of which I was inspired by and knew about, and some of which are just coming out to my knowledge, including um, a show that Shana, my, one of my collaborators, shared with us just yesterday about a show about mediumship that's coming out of England um, at the drawing room called Not Without My Ghost. So this is an article we just um, shared among us, published in Hyperallergic, a very short piece about the ideas of mediumship and practice inspiring artistic practice, but also having a connection to um, this idea of 
utopian sisterhood. So one of the, the concepts of this exhibition is that while much of the kind of visionary pursuits of the um, of the artists and the thinkers of visionary New England seem very inward looking. They seem like they're, they're something that only kind of is channeled from within. In fact, usually the practices of mediumship or having a visionary experience does relate outward into to do to the degree that ideas of social reform, empowerment, building networks is also kind of generated at the same time. So it's both inward and outward looking. And those are things that that forge that course through the exhibitions that we see here. The exhibition, I'll just show a few slides that we've just gotten from our um, amazing exhibition photographer that speak to the ways in which I wanted the actual space of the exhibition to, um, to present itself on the building of de Cordova's museum. So if you haven't been here before, you know that as you walk up to the main front entrance, there's this huge picture window. Um, we are often confused about what to do with this window. It's a beautiful space, but it, it light flows in, so it's not the greatest thing to show art within. But in this case, I was able to map this um, sort of color transparency of an artwork by the photographer Caleb Charland onto the window itself. Um, so that when light flows through it, you get this kind of cathedral-like stained glass effect on the um, opposing wall. And when it's dark outside and the lights are on in the building, it shines outward. And so I wanted the building, the decor of the galleries themselves, to be kind of activated and, and enveloped in this idea of, um, of visionary practice. As you walk into the exhibition, there's this combination, and I'll just show a few examples of this. There's, there's space, I wanted to give space for each of these artists, each of the 10 or 12 artists, um, to show something in multiple form or have a complete installation. So rather than just a single painting to speak to many ideas, I wanted to give each, each participant a kind of um, something, something meaty to show. And so um, these, these, this layering of contemporary art is also matched by, um, and here's just a view of our main gallery from the opposite lens. So I wanted the exhibition through its design and through its um, feel to also look natural. It's sort of, there's a lot of wood, natural wood. I wanted there to be a sense of kind of ritualistic space, as you can see here in the front left with this um, work that I'll talk about shortly by the artist Kim Weston, the photographs and the, the um, giant red circle that you see in front of it. So I wanted this sense of like ritualistic space plus um, a space where things are being built, either in formation or they're kind of halfway there, almost like this, this wall that you see, which is by the artist um, Sam Durant in the center of the gallery, which is just held up by scaffolding and, and um, uh, sandbags, sort of a sense of world building happening as we as we enter into the space. And so things are not are sort of incohate in certain places. They're not yet finished. And that to me is um, relevant to this idea of what utopia is. It's not something you ever actually reach and it's an imperfect idea in so many ways, but utopian world building um, is in the process. And so the, the, the idealism of utopia versus this idea that you will never actually reach it um, is inherent to much of the artist's work and some of the ideas of the thinkers who preceded them. Um, you know, the exhibition includes these clusters of um, historic art, art and artifacts and as a way to bracket them and present these thematics within the exhibition, I kind of made these clusters rather than just spreading things past and present um, out between them. Um, could have done things differently, of course, but I was pleased with how this, this was solved. And the casework and the design and many of the um, installation decisions were aided by um, Jacob Dryenforth of Show Shop. So the, the casework itself is inspired by Shaker architecture and furniture design, but it has a more contemporary aesthetic as well. So it's not, we're not seeking through this exhibition historic reenactment. We're not seeking fidelity to a past, but in fact, we're like trying to allude to a past, put your finger on something that evokes 
another time period, but it is shaped and muted and translated into the present. And so I felt like that was important, not even through the artwork that was shown that might have nods to past periods of time, type, types of art making, but even within the exhibition design itself, it kind of offers that idea. Um, and then within the exhibition are also spaces that kind of envelop you as you walk into them with a kind of different energy state, which I um, realize sounds kind of woo woo, but I believe it when you walk into these, these two galleries, you only see one image here by the artist, uh, filled with paintings by the artist Paul Laffoley, who um, ran, a, uh, founded a center called the Boston Visionary Cell um, for many years. He passed away in 2015. Um, the, the power of his paintings, the darkness of the walls, and the kind of intimacy you can have in a smaller gallery space that this presentation offers. Um, they're very hypnotic works and they draw you in. And so I wanted in a few cases to um, step away from the traditional like white cube gallery space and, uh, and allow people to enter into something more, um, something else, not even strictly defined as art, in fact. Um, the exhibition includes a catalog, so if these topics are of interest to you and um, you want to read more and um, you can purchase the catalog, there are new, new essays both by scholars and artists um, and a number of the resources including some of the things I'm talking about are also um, available to you. So I encourage if this is of interest to you to look into the catalog. It's available on Amazon and also on our, on our website. For me, this exhibition started um, even before the summer of 2017, but it really hit me while I was on a, um, a remote locate uh, in a remote location by myself for much of the time in Tenet's Harbor, Maine. And I was sort of sitting across this landscape thinking and looking at this still water. And at the same time, reading these two books, one, The Invention of Nature, Alexander von Humboldt's New World and by Andrea Wolf, and Paradise Now, The Story of American Utopianism by Chris Jennings. On the one hand, Wolf's book talks about um, the perspective of Alexander von Humboldt um, as sort of the, mo the father of modern ecology in which um, systems are connected, natural systems are interconnected and interrelational. Um, that idea really stuck with me. And then the other side, I became completely fascinated by this idea that in the 19th century, not the 60 era um, commune period that much that I was more familiar with, but in the 19th century, there was a growth, um, explosive growth and attention and excitement for communes, experiments, um, communal living practices that spread across the United States, but had a real foothold in, in New England and New York in particular. And so these two books in which the natural world and uh, creates a sense of interconnectedness that, I, that that belief system mapped with um, this idea of utopianism as a much earlier story to, to, to what I knew of before um, started me off in this path for this exhibition as well. Over time, um, I developed the show's themes into three kind of broad ones that intersect. They kind of create, of course, what you see here, a kind of Venn diagram. Um, animism, this, which I'll talk, I'll totally get to some of these topics today, but they, they are the animistic landscape um, is spiritualism true and utopian pedagogy, utopian world building and pedagogy. And so from the, from here on out, I'll kind of focus on these three clusters and talk about some of the historic precedents and contemporary artists within them. And um, we'll see how far we get. And I'm happy to, to pause um, in about 10 or 15 minutes and answer questions. And, um, and that's, that's what we'll, we'll do for this period. So you can see here, utopian wor world building um, uh, is, is inspired by um, particular sites in New England, such as Brook Farm in West Roxbury or Fruitlands in Harvard, Massachusetts, short-lived short or relatively short-lived communal living centers where um, cohabitation, co-working arrangements, um, were fostered so that people had alternatives to urban living, industrialized um, factory life for those seeking a different kind of um, model for, for their for life experiences. They, these were being founded all around the same time. Um, including I found an, another, and many of these are um, 
well documented, but one in particular in the North in Northampton or Florence, Massachusetts, called the Northampton Association of Agriculture and Education, was um, built to be strongly um, strongly related to abolitionist practices at the same time. So these are places not only where people were trying to support new ways of living, but they were trying to fight against um, uh, injustices in society that they were they were a part of at the time. And so um, a place like the Northampton Association of Agriculture was actually built within a, a silk mill. So um, silk was seen as a final, fi a finer alternative to cotton, cotton which was so associated with this, with slavery, but silk did not rely on, on, on that. And so an, about 10 families first started this association living and working together communally. And over that time, um, many visitors, including very prominent um, uh, people such as Sojourner Truth and Frederick Doug Douglass either passed through or visited or even um, joined the association. Um, and so these places were not only places of like for firm membership, but places where a lot of visitors um, and notables came through. And so they became kind of like hotbeds of activity. It's also true, particularly in the case of um, Fruitlands that um, but many other places that these utopian settlements were where very progressive educational, progressive educational systems, policies, ideas were being tested or um, the founders of these places were um, connected to school systems and the invention in, in a way of new ways of teaching. Um, and so someone like Brunton Alcott, who many of you probably are familiar with, it's um, he's the father of Louisa May Alcott, um, the founder of the Temple, the Temple School in Boston. Um, he also promoted, and he and his co-founder promoted, uh, you know, not only new education systems, but a healthful lifestyle. So they, they practiced veganism. Um, and so this sort of mind-body connection, a way of um, not exploiting the landscape, not exploiting other people, um, those were efforts that the, the members of these associations were, were promulgating. And in, in some cases as well, um, you have women rights activists or um, advocates such as Margaret Filler, not official members of places such as Brook Farm, but very adjacent to. And so Margaret Fuller had, had a cottage adjacent to Brook Farm's um, main buildings where she would host um, salon salon like gatherings with many of her followers with her followers. And so just the coursing of ideas through these spaces I found particularly fascinating. And over time, of course, these um, uh, these ideas, while all utopian um, ideas nest never last. In fact, they often get very strange and eccentric and have many fail have certain failings as um, um, that the ideas often remain. And so we see, for example, after the kind of heyday of places like Brook Farm and Fruitlands kind of existing in the 1840s, generations, within a generation or two, you have um, those ideas kind of pushing pushing other people forward. And so this woman, uh, late transcendentalist named Sarah Farmer creates a summer retreat. So rather than living full-time out, out in the landscape, she she imagines a place called Green Acre in Elliott, Maine, where, where almost like a summer salon and outdoor retreats system um, she creates and invites many outside thinkers, art people from the arts and so forth. Whoops, sorry about that. And it's in these places, outdoors, in fresh air, among the pines, is where this sort of mingling of spirituality and arts really develop. Um, and so you see speakers on these topics. You have um, what I would describe as, yeah, just this, this area, this place where um, New England's cultural landscape really has like form, like cr comes into formation without being um, officially so. It's also at a place like Green Acres where artists themselves are, are spending time. So Marsden Hartley um, worked at Green Acre in the summer of 1907. He had his first exhibition through the supporter of one of, um, a major supporter of the, the philanthropist of Green Acre. And it was in his experiences at Green Acre that he sort of 
becomes greater in touch with um, the mysticism of nature. And so he writes about that time um, as where he sort of, that's really activated his, um, his experience. And just moving forward in time in terms of this idea of utopian world building is like the other place where I was tracing this, not only in physical form, but also in written form and in books in particular. So the idea of, of, of New England having its own utopian literary history is one that I was fascinated by and is shown within the exhibition. One, of, one example, of course, is B.F. Skinner's um, book, Walden Two, which was published in 19... 48. Um, and it imagines visitors to this uh, utopian settlement called Walden II. So of course, calling attention to Thoreau's book and the place, the mystical place of Walden. But in this book, um, these outside visitors come to a um, come to Walden II where they see a better world that is based off Skinner's um, behaviorist models. So um, through correction of behavior and positive reinforcement in other models, children, and then once they become adults are living like a much more elevated life in this book. Um, what was I, what I found quite interesting in this, in this case is that um, Skinner's book, which was published in 1948, you know, Skinner goes on to become a, um, to be a psychologist as well. This book becomes extremely popular and in fact is influential to actual utopian communities forming. So across this 1960s, dozens of utopian settlements, communes, however, however you want to call them, actually formed in the United States, um, including one which you see here uh, called Twin Oaks in Virginia, founded in 1967, which is still in existence today. So in this case, I'm interested in how, you know, history, how, how fiction informs actual living practices, how books such as Walden II become um, important to, to classroom teachings. And so how these models of, of information get passed down from generation to generation. And so these, these ideas kind of filter through and get pulled. Looking at the time, I'll probably only get through a few of the artists part of this section, and maybe I'll go get a little bit further into to one of the second sections. But Angela Dufresne is an incredible painter. Many of you might know of her work. She was born in Hartford. Oops, sorry, not misspelled correctly, but Hartford, Connecticut, um, has spent a great deal of time in Maine, as well as being more or less based in New York, um, and also teaches at RISD. So her connections to New England in our conversations are evident, but also inside outside, I'd say. We have in the exhibition um, enormous, incredible paintings by Angela that recall in some cases, um, Hudson River School kind of backdrops like Bierstadt level um, sublime landscapes in front of which um, people of various genders of various generations and even human animal combinations, different sort of interspecies people of different scales as well are enacting either what looks like film sets, like they're kind of about to be directed into some unclear um, play or movie, or there's a case like in what you see here in the, in the painting called Demonstration, a central figure, this um, girl or woman standing, and all of those around her, these different creatures and people are kind of at rapt attention watching her perform in some way. And so this idea that um, you are in a world outside of society, you're in a natural place, kind of on the fringes, even on the side of a highway, where many different types of people are gathering and they're learning something. And they're in, like I said, they're in formation. I think nothing is resolved. And I think that is conveyed in Angela's own painting in that she is a master kind of colorist and master of the brush stroke. And in a way her paintings are very murky. Like they, they, they don't always reveal something very solid. And that idea, um, I find that mutability, that almost like queerness of her painting, which I think she would, she would describe it um, is, to me, very utopian in its, in its idealism, in, it, in sorry, in its an expression. 
very brushy, very, and in some cases, again, this is a kind of convening of children and adults out in nature, beset by this large woman, big, big chest, big ears, looking outward um, with an animal beside her. Um, yeah, there's just this, this sense of something that is being imparted and it's sort of gathered here. Within this section of the exhibition or in connection to these ideas, I featured also the work of Gaylene Aiken. So Gaylene Aiken is um, no longer living. She passed away in 2005. She was, um, a, I guess she would describe her as a contemporary folk artist. She's self-taught. She lived by largely by herself or with her mother. Um, and, um, and that created a world unto herself as well. And so while she's not, she wasn't aware necessarily likely of um, the utopian settlements of the 19th century, I, I believe she is someone who is building a world among her, in her mind and through her art. So the work that she, that we're showing um, here um, relate to her, she, she believed in a family, she created her own family. So she was an only child and she created her own family that she called the Rambili cousins. So on the walls, you can see here, um, a number of them, there were others, they each had a name and these are not puppets, these are people to her. They were, they're people that she lived with, she performed with them constantly. And on the walls, um, oops, she would create these panels of ep that would um, sort of memorialize almost like journalistically the, um, the episodes she had with her happy, funny cousins over and over and over again. So these panels repeat themselves to a degree, the same kinds of things happen. They're playing music, they're having fun out in, in the Vermont landscape. Um, they're running around the big family home. They're singing at moon, under moonlight. They're singing around the Nickelodeon music box. And these, um, this convening of Gaylene, which who you can see here, she often pictures herself and uses the first person to describe these these memories, even though she did not um, experience them as a child, they were true to her. And so I, I just felt like this kind of artist who normally would not be um, likely a likely candidate to be shown within a show of contemporary art or historic art, I wanted to bring um, a voice like hers side by side with someone like Angela's and that idea of childhood and that ideal idea of education and sharing something together um, is expressed through both artists. Sam Durant's work, um, who um, an artist many of you might be, some of you might be familiar with. So in 2016, Sam um, was commissioned by the trustees of reservations to create a work on the property of the old manse, which is um, where a number of transcendentalist writers lived or visited, or you know, it's a hotbed. It's kind of like mecca of, of transcendentalist thought. On that property, he had, he constructed um, this tent-like pavilion that was modeled after homesteads of that would have been built by. African Americans who lived in and around the Concord area at the time and about whom much less is known or talked about. Um, and during the summer of 2016, he hosted a series of lyceums that celebrated, honored, brought to attention, um, particularly Afri African American histories, um, intellectual histories, poetry, and other forms of spirituality, other things like that. And so the attempt of this project was to really abut these um, these what are typically told as separate histories and bring them into dialogue between transcendentalism and the um, literary and intellectual and spiritual histories of African Americans of this same place. At this end of this show, he brought back the floor of what you see here of the pavilion and it became the form of what you see here, a standing house. And we have in the exhibition, um, one panel, it's so huge we couldn't bring everything into the gallery, but just one, one of these portions um, was shown. And again, that idea of world building, that like there's a house being built in the galleries is one that I wanted to show just as like a um, nod to, to the creative act, in fact, being something that is, that is yeah, in, enacted in this way. Um, there are also 
works by Sam in this exhibition, sculptures that replicate or um, emulate furniture, both by both used by um, prominent and well-known African-American writers, such as Phyllis Wheatley, who's among the first published African-American, African, um, formerly enslaved poets and writers of, this, of the 1800s, that is set within an, uh, um, that it supports essentially a replica of um, Emerson's writing chair that is shown within the old man. So these ideas, they lock together in Sam's work. And then lastly, um, within this exhibition, within this portion of the exhibition is a major project that you can see here, the result of which is this desk um, on display by um, an artist, researcher, scholar, public humanitary, humanities um, person, Diana Limbach Limpel, um, who through the scope of her project um, wanted to ask a very broad question, which is where the woman's imagination? And she pursued that broad question through research into prominent or, you know, interesting, compelling women, particularly of the 19th century, um, such as Margaret Fuller or Elizabeth Connor Peabody, who were conveners themselves, who were containers, who brought other women together in conversation, who shared knowledge in more, in less official capacities, but for whom their own intellectual lives and knowledge sharing, like actually stimulated a whole, gen many generations to follow. And, and, and so her project sort of imagined, and I'll show you here, um, and you can go to her website and actually read more uh, longer passages about the scope of this project and its its efforts um, or here. The project imagines a place, in fact, a temple. Um, and within this temple, the lost Dorian temple of Latona, there would be this reading room. And Diana's exhibition is a kind of meta research project. It shows research fragmented alongside ceramic shards, pieces of fabric, notes, drawings, books. And it sort of emulates a research project in process that does ask that question, where is a woman's imagination? And simulates both, so in a way, simulates both the real research that Diana is conducting presently and in, over the summer, but also speculates in a kind of um, fictional place where this is, the lost library of Latona. Um, when we were planning this exhibition, Diana was actually going to be in the gallery. So she was planning to sit at her, this blue desk. She would be um, having regular hours within the show. And, um, and due to COVID, of course, we had to make a change. So instead, Diana has an identical chair at her home um, where she's working on a regular basis and this sort of presence, absence. Um, she will return to the galleries with new findings, with new materials and ch regularly change the display, but we will, um, she won't be in the space. And she's, instead of being able to speak to visitors one-on-one, -on -one, she's starting a series of interviews and sort of in a audio form, you'll be able to hear these kinds of conversations that um, in present day conversations that she would, um, but that she's studying. So I think that with that, I'm going to, and then, yeah, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because there's so much to say, but it's also the case that I wanna pause for conversation. Um, and I wanted to see, if there are any any questions to ask right now, if people want to ask questions, if not, um, I can talk a little bit more. Or people can can um, can say. So I'm just looking at. Yeah. So if you do have questions, you can you can um, plug them into the chat for form. One of the things that I would say with this exhibition is that it changed with. Um, as of course the pandemic struck and we had to shut down and the world shifted dramatically. Um, in the scope of the period of time that we were in lockdown, many of the issues that are central to this exhibition, whether it is around um, the crisis of education or needing human-to-human -human connection or 
um, rise of abolitionism and the incredible growth and am amplification of social justice issues, um, those all just, you know, arrived with such power over the past couple months um, and with greater urgency than ever before. The, the positions were already in around us. They haven't left us, unfortunately, um, but they were amplified. And so I have thought to some degree about the ways in which visionary New England um, does sort of speak to our time without, without, um, without doing it always directly, like it speaks to a past and that past sort of is a cipher for, the, for our moment. So that's something I wanted to mention just in terms of what it has meant to open an exhibition in our time right now. And I'm kind of, we're kind of living with in a, such a changing world that like within a couple of weeks, the election, the election will happen. And I feel like this exhibition and the topics will, within it could evolve and change again. Um, so. So Denise Discrell is just interested to hear more about animism. So I'm happy to spend a few final minutes just moving into that section, um, unless there are any other questions, which is totally fine. And like I said, I think because this exhibition, the scope of it is as broad as it is, and to me as rich as I'm, as um, as it is, I would, I'm, I'm thinking I will have a second a second event for this. The topic of animism is something that has interested me for some time, and it's one of the components of this exhibition that um, that was sort of in a way inspired because I work at De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum. We are embedded in the landscape. Landscape comes to, to the forefront all the time in our conversations with artists. Um, we're sitting, the museum is sitting on rock bed, a big geological kind of hillside that like has asserts its own qualities. And so this idea that that the landscape talks back to us, that the landscape um, has a presence and an agency. And in fact, humans are not dominant of it, on it, but in fact, just interconnected and part of it is something that um, comes out of a lot of these conversations we've had. Um, Within the, one of the more intimate galleries in this exhibition, I have this display of historic materials and this incredible painting by Marsden Hartley. And then they're flanked by beautiful works by the painter Josephine Halverson on the right. And then on the left, a group of large scale photographs by a main based photographer, Caleb Charland. So one of the, um, one of the, um, so central ideas around animism comes from transcendentalist writers too, of course. So you see uh, this, I, I think of it as an iconic caricature of Emerson where he's shown here as a transparent eyeball and it's inspired, uh, it's illustrated by Christopher Pierce Cranch um, in which he describes standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite spaces all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all the currents of the universal being circulate through me. Um, so this idea that someone might have an experience, an unfiltered, like almost like a raw nerve attached to the landscape, you're converted in, into just an eyeball and you have no, no layers between you and the outside world. Um, that was, that was a powerful kind of idea and connection to the artists in particular, like Josephine or um, Caleb who are featured nearby. The idea of animism, which can mean the attribution of a soul to plants, inanimate objects, natural phenomena, um, that idea has many different tentacles, but one of the, one of the, one, one portion of the display features the collection and the writings and the work of this man named William Denton and his wife and, and his family. So William Denton, while he was born in England, he settles with his family in Wellesley, Massachusetts in the 1860s. Um, and he was a kind of amateur geologist, writer, um, and he also was a regular practitioner of psychometry um, in which his wife, typically, his wife would read stones, meaning placing a stone fragment to her temple, to her forehead, 
placing her hands on stone samples, and in that process, being able to read the past lives of these geological um, specimens, whether they were, you know, emerged from lava of a Hawaiian volcano or down in Patagonia, a rock that filters dead, crumbles from an avalanche, that kind of thing. And so they would build up these really elaborate narratives of the life of these um, inanimate objects because they contained within them and still were asserting this kind of history of their own presence. And in fact, the stone itself, of course, which is like the most unlikely inanimate least person-like object becomes something that one can commune, commune with, at least in the eyes of the Dentons. They published this book called The Soul of Things, which um, is shown um, in the exhibition along with a few samples that, so people would send um, fossils, they would send stones to the Dentons through the mail and ask for readings. And so we show within the exhibition vitrines also samples of those drawings and writings and the stones themselves. Um, connected to that is, again, Marsden Hartley, who just becomes this really pivotal figure in the early 20th century in understanding this sort of mystical connection to New England and mystical attachment to nature within it. Um, Marsden Hartley visits Dogtown, which is near Gloucester, and if you haven't been to Dogtown, I highly recommend it. It's a landscape you can still walk in. It doesn't quite look like what you see here on the right because the forests have returned, hey, but it is... Sarah, sorry oh, to yeah. interrupt. We can't see your PowerPoint. Right. Oh, no. <gasps> sorry about that, guys. Sorry, sorry. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So just to step back a second, you'll see what I was talking about, this caricature of the transparent eyeball, this book cover or the frontispiece to the soul of things. And then here we are with a slide that compares a view of Dogtown and one of Marston Hartley's incredible paintings of this very bouldered la landscape. So within the landscape, speaking of an animistic presence, there are boulders that some of which are as large as houses. And this was a place, Dogtown, a place that was an originally early, not originally, but had been earlier the home of many kind of outliers, those who were kind of cast out from society, who lived on the fringes, um, who tried to make, so make something of this very in inhospitable terrain. Um, but by the late 19th century and into the early 20th century, when Hartley and others were sort of returning to Dogtown, all that remained were um, the foundations of the stone foundations of these homes. So you, if you walk into the landscape now, you will see these sunken stone arrangements. And then as you walk further, you see these huge boulders that have like come from, you can't imagine where they come from. And so this idea of both someone living in this space, no longer there, stones of just enormous size and scale that kind of exhibit their own power and dimension um, is something that has captured many writers and painters such as Hartley. And so this painting is a treasure of, that we're able to feature. And it's here that Martley talks and sort of reconnects, well, he connected with the mysticism of nature when he was um, at Green Acre, he truly reconnected three decades later um, when he was painting Dogtown, which he described as a cross between Easter Island and Stonehenge. And quickly just to follow up and um, mention the work of the, the two artists, um, Caleb Charland, an incredible Maine-based photographer, that idea of this intimate connection with nature. So C Caleb, to create this photograph, lay on the ground, in Maine at night and put his large format camera on his chest and kept the shutter open for two hours or more than two hours. And what you're seeing here is the rise and fall of his chest. So the white marks, which look like tendrils, like beautiful, very fine, almost like threads, um, are maybe stars or satellites or other features within the night sky that are moving, of course, as the sky changes through the night and also mapping onto that the, mo the very the, like light movement of Caleb's own body that it's alive and animate too. So these two things really connect to each other. Body and landscape are actually like fused together in this one image. Or here too, Caleb has been more recently um, practicing new forms of um, color separation photography that 
capture what turn into um, like radiant sunsets, rainbowed sunrises that span these incredible views, sublime views of Maine's um, landscape. So this is almost looks like a comet. You can't quite tell what it is. It's almost too beautiful. Um, but through his color separation practice, um, that's the kind of activation of something that is in the landscape, but heightened through the art, his artistry. And then Josephine Halverson, an incredible painter. I hope some of you are um, aware of her work. She's a, a professor at Boston University. In 2017 or in this area time, um, Josephine had been painting the landscape in and around her property in Western Massachusetts. And so these small scale paintings, you know, you can see here are 17 by 24 inches, um, are created in her focus of portions of the landscape where something is either a boundary is kind of is attention to boundaries to trespass to ownership in general and to kind of a presence of a land of something in the landscape that comes out and touches the artist or comes communicates out to, to Josephine and so in her um, painting practice. She works outdoors. One of these paintings is, you know, the record of her time spent looking and very closely studying the, what you can see here um, on the left, like a painting of tree bark. The scenes that she chooses are obviously not the most likely um, issue, landscape features. So these are rather chosen because they kind of call to Josephine, but they aren't um, necessarily picturesque and yet through her direct careful careful study and sort of meditation almost prayer-like experience studying the work and then putting um a pen to or sorry paintbrush to canvas um something is almost passed through that through the paint onto the canvas and so it's it's also almost like a medium ship but i hesitate to use exactly that word um but it is something that she talks about in a, in a very particular way um, that emanates from, from the grounds around her. And aware as she is of her own ownership of this, this property out in Western Massachusetts, she's also interested in those boundary owners, her neighbors, those who are there around her from previous years, um, whose landlines and property lines still kind of hold some kind of power. Um, and so those are concerns of hers that also relate to the, this idea of animism. So I think I will stop there. Realize I jumped jumped around. Um, and again, I'm happy to, to speak more at another time. Happy to answer any questions if you have them, if anyone is um, interested to stay on, but I um, wanted to finish up. So yeah, you're welcome to chat and stay on. I'll be here and thank you all. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, there are some people who are in the audience who are in the show. So Josephine, thank you for being here. Um, others, thank you for joining. It's great to see your names, even if we're not hearing, hear, each, other, hearing each other voices. <laughs> So if you're curious about seeing the exhibition, the um, De Cordova now has time tickets like many, many other museums do. So if you come to our website, we have a new website now that we're integrated with the trustees and you will, um, we require that you sign up for a time ticket entry, um, but it's um, very easy once you get it going. And I, um, I think that the, you know, we are, the show is open through mid-March. So there's a lot of time to, come into the show, come back, um, come at different times of year. Cause I think, I hope that by your experience within it, you can um, step outside to the grounds and, and um, sort of start to channel your own ideas around New England's character. So I think I will sign off now, unless you guys have questions, please be in touch. Um, through our website and through other um, means if you have questions that you want to ask about this program or about the exhibitions. Um, I would say that now that we are um, 
you know, we're in a place where things are not happening so much in person. I think our team, particularly the exhibitions that we've created, we want to be more available to the questions people might have um, that we can't sort of do in person. So be in touch and thank you all. <laughs>